you do this for a few days in a row, what you find is you start dropping really close to sleep. And it's extremely important for fi- repair of physical tissue in the body. Okay. This is why sleep helps you heal. Hold your breath as Huberman's insights peel back the layers of sleep deprivation, exposing the detrimental effects on our physical and mental well-being, casting a stark light on the urgent need for revitalizing our sleep habits for a brighter future. The other thing is that many of the people waking up after four or five hours were supposed to go to bed earlier. Remember, melatonin puts you to sleep but doesn't keep you asleep. So many of these people might be going to bed at 11 o'clock, waking up at 3 or 4 a.m., going, oh, here I am again, when actually they need to go to bed at 9. Witness the transformational power of Huberman's expert advice as he unveils the keys to a restorative sleep routine, leading you on a journey from the darkness of sleepless nights to the blissful embrace of deep, uninterrupted slumber. Okay, so that's useful because most people don't know how to do that. It allows you to fall asleep faster. It allows you to stay asleep better. And the cool thing is, so this lab in Denmark showed that it replenishes levels of dopamine in this area of the brain called the basal ganglia, which are involved in motor commands. Prepare to rewrite the narrative of your nights as Huberman's expertise breaks through the barriers of sleep disorders, unveiling a world where insomnia is conquered, dreams are nurtured, and the gentle rhythm of rest envelops your weary soul. That's kind of the top contour of it. Mm -hmm. But when one looks at the neuroscience, for instance, of sleep, you start to realize that, you know, the amount of rapid eye movement sleep that you're going to get in any 90 minute bout of sleep is your sleep is broken up into these 90 minute segments, more or less. Enter a realm where sleep becomes a sacred ritual guided by Huberman Sage Council, restoring the harmony between body and mind where the power of sleep becomes a wellspring of vitality, creativity, and emotional resilience. If you're crashing in the afternoon in a way that you don't want to, wake up in the morning and try not drink any caffeine for the first 90 minutes, maybe, or even two hours. It's kind of painful at first, yeah. but first of all, that cup of coffee tastes amazing when it does come around. And it it kind of takes you all day long. And basically you get sleepy because of a buildup of a chemical in your body called adenosine. Brace yourself for a revelation that will shake the very foundations of your sleep routine as Huberman's expert advice uncovers the hidden obstacles that sabotage your rest, empowering you to reclaim control over your nocturnal journey. Now, a lot of people who have trouble staying asleep, they have plenty of melatonin, but they're not staying asleep. And that's probably because they're not seeing the evening light. You also want to see light right about the time the sun goes down. There's two studies now that show that that really anchors all these hormones in the right way. Remember, hormones are working on the time scale of hours, days, and weeks. Dive into the depths of sleep science as Huberman's expertise unravels the secrets of circadian rhythms, melatonin production, and the art of creating an optimal sleep environment, paving the way for profound transformations in your waking life. Yeah, and getting sunlight in your eyes when you first wake up or anytime you want to be awake. I mean, that's that's such a powerful, hardwired mechanism in all mammals mm-hmm. that it's it's just you know that's the reason i i probably you know i've said it so many millions of times on the internet now people probably roll their eyes but I, I would say you know if you're not doing that you're not really setting the clock and so the rest of the stuff is secondary but i agree i think that if you're tracking things too carefully and you're too neurotic about it then uh what's coming from a device then you lose the ability to develop intuition too about your own system and yeah. Um, and look, if you're excited about the next day, you're not going to sleep as much. Yeah. And there's actually a study showing that one of the major determinants of focus and alertness and wakefulness is how excited you are about what you're doing. And it sounds almost like a, a, a like a duh kind of result. But what's very interesting is that even if sleep the night before is shorter by an hour or two, if you have positive anticipation of the next day, the quality of the sleep as as taken by EEG recordings, the quality of the sleep is actually much better. So there's something about, you know, there's a psychology to this stuff too. So I would hate for people to get so wrapped up and so neurotic about, oh, I only slept six hours. I don't know if I should train today. I don't know if I should study today. You know, I'm like, the body is resilient. So if we were to stay up for a day and a half, you just are worked, you know, you're just exhausted you have a lot of adenosine in your system. When you sleep, that gets cleared out. Mm. Caffeine is an adenosine blocker. So when you drink caffeine, Mm -hmm. you block the adenosine sort of places where it parks, we call it a receptor. Mm -hmm. But when the caffeine wears off, 
then the adenosine binds at much higher what we call affinity. Okay. And all of a sudden you just get with that adenosine crash. So when you when you wake up you're and you're kind of groggy, mm -hmm. your your body and brain are still clearing out that adenosine. Okay. If you hit the coffee right then, you're you're preloading a bit of a crash. And There's no evidence that eight is better than six, that you could very well do better on six than on eight. There are a few other things that um, turn out to be strong parameters for success in this domain. For instance, your entire life, waking or asleep, is broken up into these 90-minute ultradian cycles. If you look at ability to attend or do math problems or do anything, you know, drive, performance tends to ramp up slowly within a 90 minute cycle peak and then come down at the end of that 90 minute cycle and in sleep we go through these stage one two three four rem etc we'll talk more about that if you like those on 90 minute ultradian cycles as well ending your sleep after a 90 minute cycle at the at the near the end of a 90 minute cycle say at the end of six hours in many cases is better for you than sleeping an additional hour, seven hours, and waking mm -hmm. up in the middle of an ultradian cycle. And there are a few apps that can measure this based on body movements and things like that, that have you your alarm go off at the end of an ultradian yeah, cycle. Yeah. And if you wake up in the middle of an ultradian cycle, sometimes, not always, you can be very groggy for a long period of time. I certainly do better on six hours than I do on seven. I happen to like an eight hour sleep. It feels great, but I haven't slept an entire eight hours without waking up in the middle of the night at some point in, I don't know, forever. So cortisol is kind of like, be alert. It promotes acetylcholine, noradrenaline throughout the day, this kind of thing, dopamine. Then it tapers down. Then that melatonin pulse, boom. And now you've got serotonin. So the stuff that slow wave sleep for recovery and for brain plasticity. But having that practice of 10 minutes a day where you just chill out is really good. The other thing is just have a period of chilling out. Maybe that's on your phone. That's fine. But even better, just deliberately decompress. Even better, elevate your feet. Why do you sleep on the plane and get off the plane? You slept four or five hours and you feel like garbage. You sleep four or five hours in a bed. You feel much better. Well, brain perfusion. They've done studies now at Stanford and elsewhere, showing that if the placement of the head relative to the feet dictates how much, if my head is here, I'm not perfusing as much just by, you know, it's like mechanics and fluid, not perfusing the brain as much, not clearing out as much of the debris that accumulates in sleep, especially in areas of the brain, like the hypothalamus that control kind of core functions like anxiety. Okay, so what I was about to say is, what I just described, the variations in sleep schedules changes across the lifespan. Babies are sleeping random. Mm -hmm. Their melatonin is completely abnormal compared to an adult, but normal for a baby. So they're mm -hmm. sleeping for 90 minutes, getting up, pooping change, you know, feed the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Then toddlers, it shifts, adolescents, it shifts. And then when they're really going through their growth spurt, they're sleeping a lot, teens and adolescents. Right. And uh, that's because growth hormone is released from, you have this little, gland uh also above the roof of your mouth called the pituitary mm -hmm. and it releases growth hormone and growth hormone is released in the first part of the night the around the first half of your sleep mm -hmm. and it's extremely important for repair of physical tissue in the body okay this is why sleep helps you heal mm -hmm. and early in the night when you sleep is also when motor learning occurs Okay, so it's when you're learning your nollie heel flips. Yes. Or, well, I mean, y'all, it's when I'm learning my nollie <laughs> yeah. heel flips. Uh, and the second half of the night is when you have these really intense dreams. Mm. And that's a period of sleep when we call REM sleep, rapid REM, eye movement yeah. sleep, where people's eyes are darting back and forth, mm. but you're completely paralyzed. It's mm. what we call atoni atonic or atonia. Mm. And the second half of the night is when you're working through your emotional baggage. It's li literally like therapy or trauma release in sleep. So mm. is it, the hormone we talked about before, adrenaline, cannot be released into the body during REM sleep. So you're having these really intense dreams all about these emotional things that happened.